Hi, and welcome to the 43rd in our series on Middle Eastern Islamic history. And today we are going to talk about Ottoman internal policy during the First World War, primarily focusing on the uh, genocides. So a few rules before we start. If, you've, if you're familiar, please forgive me. This is not an academic presentation. I am not accredited in history, philosophy, religion, or any of the topics that we will be discussing today. And I will try to present it from a secular perspective, trying to do as unbiased a view of the history as I can, which of course with this topic is going to be incredibly difficult. Um, and accordingly, let's all be respectful. Um, this is a, um, yeah, as I said, this is a difficult topic to talk about, but on the flip side, I do love interactivity. So please put your questions, comments, clarifications in the chat. I do respond to the chat in real time and we will address those issues. What I like to say is these presentations are a 101 and a 201, meaning that uh, if you don't know anything, I'll catch you up. And if you already know something, I'll probably tell you something you didn't know. I have a two hour hard stop. So wherever we get to at the end of our uh, presentation, uh, at the end of two hours today, that's okay. Uh, we'll stop there, that will be the last slide. And we will start from the next slide next time we come together. I'll finish up any discussion I'm having or answer any questions, but you know that after two hours, there's not gonna be any new material that I'm going to be uh, putting forward. When I put the dates under, uh, under people, with the exception, I think, of Lepsius, um, the dates are their years of service. So whatever role they were holding, not necessarily their birth and death dates. And this, like the other entries into this series, is a recording. You can watch it later um, and uh, see it in totality with the other episodes. In fact, episodes 21 and 22 um, uh, give a much longer view of Armenian history, which if you're interested in that, is a great place to look. Um, some of the di uh, difficult modernization of the Ottoman Empire, which we'll be covering, uh, was uh, explained in episode 40 and 41. So always you can see this as a part in a long series um, that is continuing every week. All right, so there are really two points that I wanna get across. And anybody who is familiar with the CUP genocides um, it is going to feel some degree of difficulty in explaining and talking about these two points, but they're really important to walk away with. And I just want to do a note on notation first. When I say CUP, I'm referring to the a Committee of Union and Progress, which was the political party in Turkey that was dominant during World War I. And by dominant, I mean they had staged a military coup in 1913. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and so they had the full reins of power, despite it nominally being in the hands of the Sultan, the CUP as a wartime military committee was able to control all the policy. Now, there's a lot of elision between the CUP and Young Turks, and it is, and we should be clear that the Young Turks was a very diverse political movement um, seeking to modernize Turkey. The CUP were simply one part of that coalition that ended up becoming the governing force and excising the other members of that coalition that may have had different perspectives, like the Liberal Party, for example. Now, I call them the CUP genocides because there are a number of different ones. Uh, the Armenian genocide, the Pontic Greek genocide, the, uh, the Assyrian genocide. And so rather than having to say that every time, I'm just gonna call it the CUP genocides as a blanket, um, even though these genocides while very much related to each other and therefore can be thought of as one unified entity, should be understood as uh, having specific goals and targets that were slightly different in each case. All right, so the first point that I wanna stress is that the massacres and attacks that we will call the CUP genocides against the Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks of Anatolia and the Pontus fit the definitional requirements of a genocide. Right, what happened in the Ottoman Empire from 1914 until 1919 was very much a genocide. And we're gonna talk about what that means. Um, so to the degree that there is discussion and controversy around it, we're gonna address that. Um, but I wanna walk away being very clear that these are genocides. 
Then the second point, which sort of stands in contradistinction to it, is the Armenian militant groups like the Dashnak Tsutyun and the Hunshak party did present a serious threat, not an existential threat, but a serious threat to Ottoman security in Eastern Anatolia. So let's, uh, so let's sort of go through um, a little bit of the genocide definition. So uh, to sort of explain a little bit behind point number one. The genocide definition has two components. The first component is that we need to demonstrate an intent, that there is an intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. Now, the Armenians, Assyrians, and Pontic Greeks can all be seen as ethnic groups and religious groups. And to the extent that we're going to look for intent, we'll talk about intent as we move through the presentation. And there is certainly a discussion about at what point did the CUP have what intent and to what degree did each of the members of the CUP that was acting, how did they understand that intent? But among scholars of the Armenian genocide, there's really very little doubt that there were fundamental markers of intent, even if it was less obvious than let's say in the Nazi Holocaust case. And in fact, study, studies of the Holocaust routinely point out that the development towards the final solution in the Jewish case was a development over time that didn't really become crystallized until the Von C conference, which was in the middle of the war. So you have various levels of intent that change throughout the war, but nobody disputes the fact that Nazi Germany had an intent to, uh, to remove the Jewish population. So in the same way, we should understand the intent here. And the second part is that acts must be taken in line with that intent, right? You need to commit acts to, to destroy in whole or in part that national, ethnical, or racial, or religious group. And we're, and even the most ardent denialists will admit that there were acts taken throughout the conflict that served this end. Uh, there, they might disagree about whether or not there was a clear intent, whether the intent followed from the national government or was localized, all these kinds of things. And we'll discuss that in a few minutes. But they won't disagree that the acts were committed. So I have a few questions. Um, the point is it happened even after 1919. Um, what happened after 1919 was the, uh, was the Pontic Greek genocide, um, and those were part of uh, certainly uh, CUP political policy in terms of the continuation, um, but it was during the administration of uh, Kemal Atatürk um, when he was fighting the Turkish War of Independence, and so we will cover that um, and what happened in the 19, uh, from 1919 until 1923. Um, in two weeks and in three weeks when we cover the Turkish War of Independence and the Caucasian Wars. So we're definitely going to talk about those continue, uh, continuations. There's a question of, are you familiar with Eugenides' historical fiction? And if so, do you consider it accurate to this era? The only story of Eugenides that I know is Middlesex, which is really not about this. It's about growing up in Detroit and being hermaphroditic um, or, or I guess a trans woman. Uh, I at that time, the, the lines were blurry. Um, so I don't really know how this, uh, what, what he says, so I can't really say. Um, there's a question is, is a genocide per definition still truly a genocide, even as if part of war? Um, yes, um, I would say a genocide in the context of war is still a genocide, and if, it happens that groups within the genocided group, uh, genocided population happen to also have militants. That doesn't obviate the claim of genocide. You simply don't target the civilian population for complete erasure. It, the, the, there's a difference between trying to deal with an insurgent group and killing civilians as collateral damage and removing civilians on mass um, as an active policy to end a nation. 
Um, yeah, there's uh, there are a few comments. Jeffrey Eugenides is a is a fiction author. It's uh, yeah, it's not it's not about how these events are fictitious. Okay, so that's that's the first part, and there are three ways that that really comes to manifest in the CUP genocides. We see that um, it's possible to kill members. Uh, um, that killing members of the group uh, would be part of those acts causing serious physical harm or mental harm to members of those groups. And those terms have been legally defined um, because uh, when we're talking about mental harm, we're talking about entire mental breakdowns, uh, things like that, or serious physical harm. We're talking about the cutting up of bodies. We're, uh, we're not talking about uh, light effects. And finally, uh, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group so that they can be raised as with a different identity. Now, there's another question about um, whether, uh, sorry, whether these events have been defined by a court of law as a genocide. These events have not been defined by a court of law as genocide, presume uh, from the main function of the fact that world courts didn't arbitrate the question of genocide until long after the events of the CUP genocides had taken place. That said, there's another comment from the same person that argues that the European courts rejected that this was a genocide. I believe that you're referring to the Pentrelic decision in 2015. And in that decision, the court did not reject the claim that this was a genocide. In fact, it said, it stated emphatically that it was a genocide. But the question was whether or not a Turkish representative had the right based on a freedom of speech uh, permission to claim that the events were not a genocide, even though there were Armenian genocide denial laws in the country, uh, Switzerland in this case, in the country where he was stationed at the time. And the court found that he has the right to deny the genocide, not that the genocide is not a historical event. Now, there are questions, would the actions of the Ottomans expressing the Greek revolt of 1821 also be considered genocide? Um, I actually discussed the Balkan revolutions in episode 28, and I would encourage you to watch that. Um, the massacres by both the Greeks against Turks and by the Turks against Greeks could be considered localized genocides. Um, they are not national level genocides because we don't have orders from the top talking about these uh, attempts to kill off large numbers of civilians, but they certainly do bear intents to destroy in part, a national, ethnical, or re racial religious group, and the manifestation of acts designed to do that. Um, there's another question of, do you consider rape as a genocidal act? It depends. Rape can be a genocidal act if it is used as a systematic way in order to repress a population. Um, and in the case of the CUP genocides, we absolutely see that. Um, and we've seen it in other genocides as well. Um, the Rwandan genocide also had uh, rape as a form of uh, genocide action. Okay. Now, the other point, and I wanna come back to this, is that a uh, in the Armenian community, especially, but you see it also in the Greek community, um, there is this view that there is no difference or distinction uh, between the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide in terms of the functional view that there was a victim and a perpetrator, and um, the Armenians presented no possible issue to the Ottoman Empire. This is untrue. The Armenians had organized into militant groups, and those militant groups had, and we'll discuss the degree to which these are functional or not, relations with Russia, which was a historic enemy of the Ottoman Empire. That there was a fear at all in the Ottoman Empire concerning the possibility of integrating the Armenians is not the same as the possibility um, of integrating Jews into the German state in 1930. There were no uh, Jewish organizations that are similar to the Dashnaks or the Hunchaks, and there was no logical argument that could be made um, within 1930s Germany that Jews were going to rebel and or try to create an autonomous state and or um, work with the enemies of the German state. Uh, it's simply just not the case. Um, in, 
So to the extent that Armenians were to a certain degree agitating, we, we should make that distinction. And we should make a distinction that Turkey or the Ottoman government had some duty to its uh, citizens to protect the borders of its state. And that could involve attacks on Armenian militant groups. Uh, there's a comment there were pogroms about 20 years earlier to the Armenians, so th there was a history of harm to the Christian group, and that's absolutely true. I covered that in episode 41 of this series. Um, I, uh, I encourage you uh, to watch that where we talked about the Hamidian massacres. All right, so now because of the controversy concerning the CUP genocides, I need to address the denialism arguments. So probably the most common denialism argument in the Holocaust case is a denialism case of magnitude. And this is, uh, so for example, in the Holocaust, it's, it's understood by scholars that between 5.2 and 7.5 million Jews and roughly 5 million non-Jews were murdered uh, by the German, Nazi German apparatus through various means, be it the Einsatzgruppen, which were the deployment task forces, which shot Jews on site, or the death camps uh, where they were gassed. Um, and so the denialism in, the, in this case would refer to that number. And they'll say something like, we don't believe that roughly 6 million Jews died. We believe that the number is closer to 100,000, right? We're talking about less than 10% of the number uh, quoted by, um, by the international scholars and the, and the victims. We don't see this as much in the Armenian case. When we're talking about denialism in, in the Armenian case and in the wider CUP genocide case, we really don't see magnitude issues. That's not to say that there aren't quibbles over numbers. There absolutely are. Uh, the Armenian government supports a number of 1.5 million. I've seen Turkish arguments that range between 600,000 and 800,000. Um, the majority of genocide scholars tend to uh, sit between the number 1.0 1, 1, 1. and 1.2 million. Um, so you have uh, a variety of numbers and disagreement, but even that 600,000 number is not an order of magnitude lower than 1.5 million, which is the maximalist number. Um, and in the CUP genocides overall, we're probably talking about close to 2 million, 2.5 million, if you add up all the different groups that were massacred. Um, but nobody is claiming uh, these sorts of numerical disparities to the same degree as we do in the case of uh, the Holocaust. So where do we see denialism? The first is in the form of the justification. And you can sort of imagine it with that Chicago song in the background, right? They had it coming. They only had themselves to blame. If you'd have been there, if you'd have seen it, I bet you, you would have done the same, right? Um, and the justification argument comes um, as a result of large scale conflict between the Ottoman Empire and Christian countries, many of whom used to come out of former Ottoman territories along with the Armenian relationship with the Russian Empire, which was the historic enemy of the Ottoman Empire. And so this denialist argument usually goes along the lines of if the Armenians had just been sensible and not aligned, um, they wouldn't have suffered this way. And the fact that they suffered this way was inevitable because if they, if they didn't collude, if sorry, if they hadn't colluded with the Russians, then there would have been no need uh, to fight the Armenians, there would have been no need to deport the Armenians, and accordingly, um, that they suffered was a natural outgrowth of the war. And the Ottoman authorities were justified in controlling the territory. We're going to point out that several of these points are false. The first one is that the CUP had a long-standing intent uh, to commit genocide uh, far before World War I started. We're going to talk about uh, Armenians and their contributions to the Ottoman state. We're going to talk about the way that the genocide was, uh, the way that genocides were perpetrated, um, and it, the relationship that the Armenians having with the Russians was not entirely clear. And so this justification argument simply doesn't hold water. In fact, many of the areas that were closest to the front were actually the hardest for the Ottomans to operate in, in terms of deporting Armenians. So Armenians were actually more often deported from areas further from the front which doesn't make sense if this is done for a wartime benefit. 
Another one is the intent. We'll often see this among more educated genocide deniers that will say that there aren't clear documents that show uh, that the Ottoman intent was to exterminate the Armenians. Primarily the intent was to relocate them. Um, again, we have a lot of firm evidence to the contrary of this argument. Uh, we have an, a number of statements from Kurdish irregulars in the East uh, saying that they had been paid to kill Armenians. We have the creation of the Teshkilete Mehsusa. We're going to talk about that. That's the special organization. Um, and the formation of that organization was designed specifically to increase the hardship for civilians. We have a number of other uh, acts that together show that the CUP was intending to remove those populations, not simply from where they were, but remove them altogether. The next one is uh, the argument of calamity, saying that um, war is a calamity and many Muslim civilians did die during the, during the period of World War I. So the fact that Armenian civilians, Turkish, uh, sorry, Armenian civilians, Assyrian civilians and um, Greek civilians died is a natural outgrowth of the horror of war and it doesn't uh, point to anything more than a massacre happened um, as opposed to uh, that this was an intentional destruction of a people. And while in this war, um, within the Ottoman territory, there were no um, massacres of Muslims that were done with genocidal intent, there were certainly massacres of Muslims with genocidal intent that occurred before this war, and we will discuss those. Um, that said, um, we do see massacres from some uh, Christian soldiers which, uh, which don't rise to the level of genocide because of the lack of organization, um, but certainly massacres of Muslim populations. And to the extent that those are crimes, they should be recognized as crimes. That does not obviate the clear difference in state power that occurred within the Ottoman Empire and the clear difference of an intentional organized development. And finally, there is the concept of uh, the exclusivity. Um, a lot of denialists will argue that they will recognize the Armenian genocide when the genocides of the Mohajir, those immigrants who came uh, to the Ottoman Empire just prior to World War I um, because of the 19th century and early 20th century uh, massacres and genocides in the Caucasus region or in the Balkans region um, are recognized as genocides. Those of you who are familiar with my history series know that I've already talked about the Circassian genocide of 1867. I talked about that in episode 27. I talked about a number of massacres and genocides of Muslims in the Balkan nationalism session in, in, uh, in, uh, in 28. Um, so I feel that I'm on very firm ground saying that if I recognize those genocides as genocides, then we should recognize this genocide as this genocide. And it doesn't uh, bode well um, to pretend that um, we're not recognizing both because we are. Um, there's a comment, uh, Erdogan has stated, we do not crit, uh, commit a crime, therefore we need not apologize. It's not possible for those who belong to a Muslim. Richard, nation. Richard, I'm sorry. Please do not read that one. Uh, it's, it, it's a little incites religion hate. I don't, want, I don't want you to read that one. I apologize. No, I, I think it's actually worth commenting on this because it's a political statement. Um, it's not possible for those who belong to the Muslim faith to carry out genocide. That's, it's simply untrue. And it's simply untrue that because any person can carry out genocide. Um, it's not a question of whether um, the Turks were Muslim or not. Uh, it's a question of what was the policy at the time and how was it executed? Um, and Erdogan, like most uh, Turkish politicians, has continued the policy of denialism. And there are reasons for it. There are political reasons for it. Um, because if the Turkish government recognizes that the Armenian genocide took place, that the Pontic Greek genocide took place, that the Assyrian genocide took place, they may have to make concessions. Uh, in the same way that the Germans have paid reparations for the events of the Holocaust, Turkey could be forced to make, pay reparations. Turkey could be forced to cede territory to Armenia. There could be a lot of different things that Turkey could be asked or forced to do because of recognizing the genocide. And so rather than recognizing the genocide, um, Turkey prefers to deny it in order to prevent having to take those additional steps.
Um, so, sort of as a review, right, we had a lot of um, upheaval in the Ottoman Empire towards the end of the 19th century. And part of that upheaval was the creation of the Ottoman parliament in 1876. Now, the parliament didn't survive for very long, primarily because of the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 to 1878. Now, this war was incredibly disastrous for um, the Ottoman Empire on a number of fronts, but there are a few things that I really want to point out here. While you don't see it in, the, in these pictures, the bulk of the war was actually fought in the Balkan region, and many Turks, um, and by Turks I mean Muslims of various ethnic persuasions, uh, sorry, of uh, various ethnic persuasions um, were caught up in uh, the war and either massacred or forcibly deported. Um, and the Russians were successful to the point where they were in a suburb of uh, Constantinople at that time called San Stefano. Uh, now it's called Yeshilkoy. Um, and they forced the Ottoman Empire into a very humiliating surrender. But if we take a look at the Caucasian side, we have the Russians being led by four Armenian generals. Now, this is because Armenia, um, Eastern Armenia, is within the territory of the, of the Russian Empire, and there are Armenians in the Russian government. But the fact that Armenians happen to be the ones chosen to lead uh, the Russian war effort, and that the Russians begin to conscript Armenians within their territory, uh, tends to look more negative towards the uh, Ottoman Empire and the idea of um, uh, yeah, so it created this sense in Turkey that there was collusion between the Armenians and the Russians. Um, and this was just one piece of evidence in their perspective. Now, there were, um, this war was incredibly uh, destructive in terms of the border in the east as well. If you look on the map, all those areas on the other side of the purple line, those areas became part of Russia as a result of the, um, as a result of the border clashes. There's a comment of, please also talk about the French legionnaires who were Armenians that terrorized Southern Turkey in 1919 to 1920. I will talk about them, but not today. That's going to be part of the Turkish War of Independence, which I'm gonna discuss in two weeks, right? Because that's sort of in that period. Um, the next uh, question was, is there anything like an international statute of limitations on genocides? As far as I'm aware, there isn't, but I don't know how you would, prosecute the Armenian genocide except by using expert testimony at this point. Um, there really aren't survivors in order to have a court case. And also, I don't know who could convene the court case. There, there's a subject matter jurisdiction issue, right? Who has the right to adjudicate that? Um, so there, that's the reason why there really isn't any court trial that determines whether there was a genocide and what kind of responsibility Turkey may have to accept. To the extent that we want to have trials over the genocides, and we're going to talk about those in two weeks also, we have uh, the Istanbul Courts Martial of 1919 to 1920, um, where the caretaker government actually found many of the CUP perpetrators to have been guilty of genocide, and we have um, and we have uh, the trial of Sohumon Tehlirian who was an Armenian who lived in Berlin and assassinated uh, Mehmet Talat. Um, and in his trial, um, his defense was not that he didn't do it, but that he was driven insane by the acts of the Armenian genocide and had to kill Talat as a result. And so a lot of expert testimony was brought forward to justify that the Armenian genocide had taken place in order to prove this defense. Um, but at a fundamental level, if Turkey recognizes the Armenian genocide as, an, as a diplomatic act, there will be mounting pressure for Turkey to do something about that. So even if Turkey wouldn't lose a legal case, they would lose the court of public opinion. 
um, and that could almost be worse. Now, as we mentioned, during the war of 1877 to 1878, there were massacres on both sides. You can see on the right-hand side, um, uh, the massacre at Tarnava, Tarn uh, and we've talked about this before, that is a Bulgarian massacre of Turks, and that was both Ottoman Muslim citizens and Ottoman Jewish citizens, and so they fled Tarnava. You also have the execution of the Bashi Bozuks. The Bashi Bozuks were um, a militant organization um, sort of an irregular army of Muslims that operated primarily in the Balkans. Um, most were ethnically Armenian, uh, sorry, most, most were ethnically Albanian, um, and, uh, but you had also Slavic uh, and Turkish members. That said, the, the executions of the Bashi Bozuks were not only targeted at those militant groups, but, among, but also to any Turk that was believed to have been a Bashi Bozuk. Um, and by Turk, I mean any Muslim-oriented citizen of the Ottoman Empire. And then, of course, on the left-hand side, you can see massacres perpetrated by Muslims, um, such as the massacre of Bulgarians at Stara Sagora, and the Armenians uh, fleeing uh, Kurdish and Circassian attacks into Georgia. Um, we don't know exactly when Kurds and Circassians began to attack Armenians. Of course, Circassians couldn't have attacked them before they were uh, subject to their own genocide and deported in 1867. And as a result of that deportation came to live in the Ottoman Empire, but the Circassians, when they were brought to the Ottoman Empire, were often brought as shock troops in the sense of they would be settled into communities that the Ottomans felt were dangerously falling towards being um, non-Ottoman controlled. And accordingly, uh, they wanted Muslims they felt they could rely on in those areas. And so Circassians were brutalized by the Russian Empire and, and as a result became brutal themselves uh, towards those in their vicinity. Now, after the Treaty of San Stefano, um, the Germans intervened and actually uh, created the Congress of Berlin, which reallocated territories and gave more land to the Ottoman Empire which angered the Balkan states because in many respects, they believed that they had a right to the land they had acquired under the Treaty of San Stefano. In fact, if you look at this map and you see that sort of brownish black line that goes from the Western border of Bulgaria all the way to the Aegean Sea, you can see the territory that Bulgaria was promised under the Treaty of San Stefano. Um, and of course that was reined in substantially by the Congress of Berlin. Now, we mentioned that there was an Ottoman parliament that had set, uh, been set up, but Abdul Hamid II uh, really did not like the parliament and used the failure uh, in the war of 1877 to 1878 as a way to usurp power and do what was called istibdad or uh, reorganization, reconsolidation of power. Um, and he abolished uh, the parliament ruling as, uh, ruling as, a direct autocrat and monopolizing power from his palace at, Yil, uh, at Yildiz. So as part of his autocratic tendencies, what he decided to do was to streamline thought. And so as we talked about in episode 40, um, he built a number of schools. Uh, you can see the Darul Funun Shahane or the National Academy of the Arts um, on the right-hand side. And um, one of the things that uh, Abdul Hamid II did was that he fraternized with Muslim fanatics. And this term refers to those Muslims who were agitating for uh, domestic conflict. They were agitating for war against uh, the other minorities. And in many ways, those minorities were connected with the prospect of liberalism and democracy, because many of the movements that had led to the creation of the parliament were those that believed in equality for all citizens of the Ottoman Empire, as opposed to an, a Muslim supremacist view. Now, Abdul Hamid II was a Muslim supremacist. He believed that Muslims should have superior rights to non-Muslims within the Ottoman Empire, and the mistreatment by Christians during the uh, War of 1877 to 1878 confirmed for him that equality would result naturally in massacres. So he forced into exile any Turkish 
uh, individual who was more liberal on the spectrum and might advocate for reforms in line with uh, in line with increasing civil rights and liberties for minorities. And at the same time, he created the Mura Hafia, which was a secret police, and the Yildiz Istiparat Tashkireti, or the Yildiz Intelligence Agency, um, which was responsible for weeding out dissenting thought within the Ottoman Empire. At the same time, because of Germany's uh, better treatment of the Ottoman Empire in the Congress of Berlin, uh, an alliance was established between Germany and the Ottoman Empire, and this alliance would uh, serve uh, the Ottoman Empire well until uh, World War I, um, when it would come into the war on the German side. And we'll talk about the Ottoman war effort itself uh, next week. So well, now we sort of turn our eyes to the Armenians, who are called the Milati Sadika, or the loyal minority, or the loyal nation, uh, depending on how you want to translate Milit. Um, and you can see on the map on the right-hand side, that the Armenians are concentrated primarily um, in the region of Cilicia, which is that area sort of at the corner of the Mediterranean Sea, and towards Lake Vaughan, um, which you can see on the eastern side. You can tell that a region has more Armenians, the more blue that region is, up to about, um, if it's dark blue, uh, that's even over 50% of the population of that region is Armenian. Some of the greenish regions are around 20% uh, percent Armenian. So, and you also have to recognize that we have, and the reason, sorry, you have to remember the reason that they were called the Milati Sadika or the loyal minority is that they were the only ones who did not outwardly rebel. Uh, in contrast to the Greeks, the Bulgarians, um, the Serbs, the, yeah, uh, and uh, other Christian groups, um, this was the only Christian group that did not rebel. Now, similar to other uh, minority groups in the Ottoman Empire, there was a huge difference between the representatives of the millet and the people that they represented. Um, the representatives of the millet lived in uh, the Kumkapa district of Istanbul and were called Amira class Armenians. Um, and so you can see a family of them. You can see they have aristocratic style clothing, a very modern dress and are relatively well integrated uh, into uh, the Ottoman system. On the upper left-hand side, you can see protests out in the provinces um, for the right of self-defense. Armenians protested for a number of distinct rights. The right for self-defense was an important one, especially considering, as we pointed out, that Kurds and Circassians attacked Armenian populations um, throughout the 1870s. And so Armenians wanted the right to be able to fight back um, when they were attacked by Kurds. That right took a long time in coming. So we start dealing with uh, this uh, question or the Eastern question. Now, the Treaty of Berlin was supposed to resolve that the six Eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire with large substantial Armenian populations, you can see those provinces uh, in the map on the right-hand side, that those provinces would be subject to a number of reforms and those reforms would be reviewed by the European powers um, in order to determine whether or not they were in the Armenians' benefit. Of course, none of that ever happened. Um, the reforms were never made and the Ottoman Empire used uh, its relationship with Germany to prevent um, other countries from forcing its hand. Now, there was a, a lot of conflict within the historic ally of the Ottoman Empire, which had been the British. The British had stood by the Ottoman Empire through much of the 19th century. And um, Benjamin Disraeli, prime minister of the United Kingdom, wanted to maintain a strong relationship with the Ottoman Empire as a counterbalance uh, to the French uh, in Egypt. But as the British were becoming more and more powerful in Egypt, especially after the 1882 Anglo-Egyptian War, that was no longer necessary. And the British, we're beginning to see the hypocrisy in defending the Ottoman Empire. You can see from example, this political cartoon where the British are rejudging their position um, despite having passed numerous laws that allow them to take advantage of the Ottoman economy. Um, suddenly uh, the moral case is more important than the economic case. And that was advocated very strongly by Disraeli's primary contender uh, in Britain, that's William Gladstone. And his famous quote is, of course, to serve Armenia is to serve civilization. 
arguing that uh, the Armenian people and the defense of the Armenian people is necessary um, for the case of liberalism, which Britain was championing. There are, there's a question, did they have any formal alternatives to self-defense or was the lack of alternative the reason for agitating for self-defense rights? The Armenians didn't trust the Turkish um, governmental organization and they didn't trust it for two reasons. The first one is that prior to 1908, and that's where we are now, um, prior to 1908, um, most of Eastern Anatolia was not directly run by Constantinople. It was run by a number of Turkish tribes and chieftains who reported to governors and those governors would report to Istanbul. But those Turkish tribes and chieftains had a lot of control over the domestic policy in their areas. And so it simply didn't make sense to the extent that there were um, Turkish governors um, who were more active. Uh, they uh, often put Armenians in prison, um, regardless of whether they were the victim or the perpetrator in any particular squabble. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, the situation in Ottoman prisons was not terribly friendly uh, to anybody, uh, but certainly not to the minorities. So self-defense was in many ways the Armenians' way of being able to level the playing field uh, with the Muslims who would attack them. We can see that the Armenian community begins to have seeds of discontent and desperation. And we talked about this a little bit in episode 41. Um, when the Congress of Berlin was assembled in 1878, the Armenians sent a representative, they sent the Catholicos. A Catholicos and the Catholicos is an Armenian leader uh, from a religious perspective. Um, and he represents all of the Armenians responding to that holy see, right? That holy center. So this is Mekertic Hremian, and he was sent to uh, the Congress of Berlin. He was refused entry because, of course, Armenia was not a country and therefore should not be allowed to participate in a meeting of countries. But this lack of power resulted in the creation within Armenia of political parties that would begin to advocate for them. Probably the most, uh, probably the earliest of those was the Armenikan Party, uh, founded by Mekertic Portukalian. And the point of the Armenikan party was to advocate for Armenian rights, especially the Armenian right of self-defense, but also Armenian rights of equality and tribunals and other, uh, other issues that we're going to see based on the grievances that they had. That said, the creation of these political parties began to breed a lot of distrust uh, by Abdul Hamid and many in his circle of ruling Ottomans. Um, and those were amplified by the Bashkale incident, which is that near the town of Bashkale, um, three Armenians were pulled over and um, they had been involved in the Armenikan party and they were seeking to um, fundraise and to Im increase relations with Russia. And the Ottoman Empire, rather than seeing it as a fledgling group that barely had any political power, trying to find a way to have more political power, um, saw it as evidence of a wide-scale conspiracy between the Armenians and the Russians, further um, inflaming the belief that there would be a problem. And so as a response, uh, Abdul Hamid and his uh, uh, supporters put together what were called the Hamidia Alelara, or the Hamidian um, Irregulars. And these Irregulars, were made up of Circassians and Kurds, as well as Turks, and would have the ability to attack the Armenian population um, without direction from Abdul Hamid directly. Now, if the Hamidia, uh, the Hamidian uh, irregulars attacked Armenians, um, they were often given judicial sanction, meaning that the courts would not go out and prosecute them for these acts against the Armenian people. So you resulted in a number of different Armenian grievances by the end of the 19th century. And those are, they wanted the right to resist Kurdish raiders, oftentimes um, both Hamidian irregulars and, and uh, Kurdish tribes in the region would attack Armenians and they did not have the right to self-defense. They wanted, uh, they had issues with property extortion. Oftentimes, um, Kurds or Circassians who wanted more property would use violence to acquire that property from Armenians or threaten violence uh, in order to acquire that property. Or on a, on a lesser scale, they would, for, they would use extortion to get 
uh, monetary compensation. Another thing is that Armenians had difficulty if they had a contract with a person who was Muslim um, in terms of getting the courts to enforce um, any contract or debt owed to an Armenian. You also have cases of forcible conversion, and those will escalate as we go through um, the massacres and genocides. But even in peacetime, there were um, situations where the most beautiful girl of the village would be stolen, taken by a Muslim family, forcibly converted, um, and raped, and then forced to live with that family. There was a debate within Ottoman society as to whether forcible conversions could or should be acceptable. Um, and in many cases, those who refused to accept the viability of forcible conversion would look the other way when evidence surfaced that it had actually occurred. Um, you also had agricultural competition. One of the developments of the late 19th century was industrialization. And so it required fewer people to actually be involved in farming a large amount of territory. And so there was natural competition between Armenians and Kurds who were farming the same lands. Um, and as each became more efficient, others were laid off, resulting in hardship for those who couldn't make economic success for themselves. We talked about the issue with prisons. Both Muslims and Christians who were in prisons faced a lot of hardships. Uh, they did not get sufficient food and often had to rely on their family members bringing them food, which in particular was a difficulty for Armenians because Armenians were often imprisoned as far away from their towns as possible. This didn't happen as much with Muslims. We also have an issue that affected both Muslims and Armenians, which is that um, there wasn't medicine, there wasn't a good healthcare system uh, for those people who were in prison. And so it resulted in a lot of pain and suffering for those Armenians who were in prison. And this fed into a number of the other grievances they already had. We also have cases where um, we have cases of forcible rape. Um, and judges um, who are Muslim, uh, in many cases, almost all cases, and they will use a very strict standard of evidence in order to uh, prevent the prosecution of, of guilty of Muslims who have clearly committed the acts um, in order to avoid impugning the name of a Muslim. Um, and in particular, uh, one case that stands out, uh, there was a young woman uh, and she was asked, uh, because the judge insisted that the only way that her rapist could be convicted is if she herself gave testimony. Now, the difficulty, of course, of this is that not only would the Turks judge her badly, and she would have to probably be afraid for the rest of her life if she gave testimony against um, a Turk, but the Armenian community as well was extremely conservative. And so she said, you're asking me to say things I would not even tell my own kinsmen, yet, let alone tell you. Um, I, I, can't, I can't talk about these things. And even today, where there is an incredible amount of protection for rape victims uh, in Western society, uh, it's still very difficult uh, to, for rape victims to bring forth testimony. So you can imagine the difficulty at this time period. And the judge ordered that because she did not testify, she would not testify um, as to the nature of her rape, that he had no uh, usable evidence um, to say that a rape had actually occurred and therefore let off um, the rapist. Um, and that case is not unique. Uh, that's very symptomatic of what was going on during this period. We also have a number of mullahs who are fanatical, right? That same fanatical group that uh, Abdul Hamid associated with. And these fanatical imams argued that Muslims in court were permitted and in fact should give false testimony to judges in order to prevent themselves from being found guilty of crimes. And if Armenians, uh, and if they wanted to extort something from Armenians, they should give false testimony in order to promote the incarceration um, or deprivation of Armenians. Now, what was motivating these mullahs is not religious doctrine for the most part. What's motivating them is a sense of social class disorder, uh, disturbance. And the reason is that during the 19th century, a number of laws have increasingly blurred the line between Christians and Muslims um, within the empire. 
And a lot of uh, a lot of these mullahs were Muslim supremacists, and so they saw being Muslim as being superior to being non-Muslim, and that they and that Muslims should have a superior treatment. So if the courts were already skewing in their view towards equality, um, it was in the moral perspective of the Muslims to challenge that equality. And the final issue that the Armenians had was uh, taxation and collection. Now, as I pointed out, the Kurds in the East owned territories that had been divided to them. And these devices were called ikta, or um, And so these Kurds would own them. And as a result, they could charge taxes and collect money from the populations that lived there as a form of rent seeking. And um, the problem here is not that taxes were collected. It's that taxes were collected at varying rates and often at significantly higher rates for non-Muslims than for Muslims. And so the Armenians were dealing with tax rates that we're talking about orders of magnitude higher. Um, we even have cases where Kurds tried to collect on taxes during the genocides, uh, sorry, during the Hamidian massacres, we're gonna talk about those. Um, they tried to collect on mass, on, and when, of course, the Armenians were running for their lives and therefore couldn't generate wealth, um, and they were asking for back taxes uh, for those years. So you have grievances relating to tax collection being exorbitant and, uh, and dangerous. So as a result of this panoply of grievances, um, um, so because of this panoply of grievances, you have developing two uh, major political parties among the Armenians. The first one is the Dashmat Sutyun, or the Armenian Revolutionary Front, and the second are the Hunchaks. And the Hunchaks um, are a socialist party. Um, the Dashmat Sutyun, um, or I'm going to say Dashnaks, um, was a federation of a number of different political parties that decided to unite under one banner. The Hunchaks refused to uh, unite with them uh, primarily because um, they disagreed on the, uh, on the socialist slash capitalist uh, result of uh, Armenian unity. So um, you can see the founders of the Dashnaks uh, there. Um, and the Dashnaks, had a political problem, which was that the Armenian patriarchate, patriarchate in Constantinople was part of that Amira class, right? They were not dealing with the problems in the East. They were dealing with problems um, that the Amira class was facing. And so they were reticent to support any revolutionary organization that could worsen their prestige and worsen their position. So you actually had uh, Imkum Kape, which is the, um, the Armenian quarter in uh, in Constantinople. You have a demonstration in 1890 where the where the Dashnaks actually enter the church and force um, the Armenian patriarch to support the Armenian revolution and its goals in terms of modernizing and reforming Turkey. Now, um, now one of the main issues that uh, that we that we see here, right, is that there's this relationship between the Armenian political structure um, that the Ottomans had built and therefore had loyalty to the Ottomans and the Armenian pol political structure that was developing in response to these grievances. Now, the Dashnaks and the Hunchaks were not entirely an Ottoman creation. In fact, uh, like a, a creation within Ottoman territory, they were primarily funded and organized at least in the onset in 1890 when they were founded by the Russians and operated out of Russian controlled what's today Armenia, but at that time it was part of the Russian Tsardom. And so you have um, a difficulty that these uh, Dashnaks have in terms of convincing Armenians within the territory of Armenia to actually stand uh, and fight for them. Many of them, uh, while they wanted new political rights, didn't want to use uh, physical violence in order to achieve that. That said, the Hunchaks especially, but the Dashnaks soon after them, sent fidei or, uh, or militant soldiers into the territory of the Ottoman Empire in order to ostensibly defend Armenians uh, from violence from Kurds or Circassians. In particular, one uh, 
one bit of violence blew out of proportion, and that was in the town of Sassoon. Um, in 1894, um, there was uh, a number of uh, Kurdish attacks trying to acquire money from the uh, uh, Armenians of Sassoon. And so the Armenians organized behind the Hun Chakvidai, um, led by uh, Mezin Murad, and he fought uh, against the Kurds, showing that um, the Hunchaks could actually fight uh, within the territory of the Ottoman Empire and uh, possibly secure that territory. Um, now, the Ottoman Empire responded to the Hunchaks and the Sassoon resistance was put down. Now, it's important to point out that these groups, the Dashnaks and the Hunchaks, didn't limit their attacks to um, only Muslims who were taking up arms against Armenians. They did target civilians in a number of cases and should and would be considered terrorists uh, by today's uh, by today's understanding. Following the Sassoon revolt, we then have the Hamidian massacres, where Abdul Hamid II um, uh, ordered his uh, Hamidia Alalara, his Hamidian irregulars, along with the Kurds and Circassians, um, to take care of the Armenian situation. And so you have numerous massacres um, that responded directly to those orders. Um, in the city of Diyarbakir, you have significant sections of the city that were burned. Um, at, uh, and you can see in that picture, uh, soldiers uh, killing, slashing Armenians uh, with their bayonets, um, raping them. Uh, some of those rapes were followed by forced conversions. We have uh, religious incitement, again, from those fanatical mullahs. Um, and we have a number of uh, different situations. Of course, that is not a church from Urfa. That's just a burning church but I used it to symbolize the church in Orfa that was burned. The Armenians were locked in the church and the church was burned with them in it, 3,000 died. You can see the Armenian corpses littering the ground near Erzurum, which was, a uh, which was an area with a large Armenian population. And the Hamidian massacres, which occurred from 1894 to 1896, were responsible for the deaths of between 100,000 and 200,000 Armenians and around 20,000 Assyrians. And following these massacres in 1897, Abdul Hamid declared that the um, Armenian question was closed, meaning that there would be no future for the Armenians um, in any political sense within the Ottoman Empire. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't any Armenian resistance to these massacres. Um, in particular, uh, this town of Zeytun in 1895 uh, revolted successfully. They had the protection of the mountains. Um, and you also have um, the Khanasur expedition, which in 1897 was uh, led by the Dashnaks in retribution uh, for the Hamidian massacres, and they targeted a number of Turkish villages. So one of the things that we should sort of point out here, and it's going to come up a few times, is that we have a number of missionaries that are operating in the Ottoman Empire in the 1890s and throughout World War I. And these missionaries are converting Christians to Christianity. That is to say that the Armenian church, the Assyrian uh, church of the East, um, these are not Western churches. There are Assyrians who are Chaldean Christians, and those Chaldean Christians are Catholic, and therefore that is a Western church. But by and large, uh, Armenians, um, Assyrians, Pontic Greeks as well, who are Orthodox, are not either Protestant or Catholic. And so you see Protestants and Catholics coming primarily from the United States and Germany, but also other places as well, operating within the Ottoman Empire, especially in areas where Armenians are concentrated, because of course, those are the people that they're trying to convert. Within the Ottoman Empire, it was of course illegal to convert a Muslim to, non, to a non-Muslim religion, but it was perfectly permissible to convert between non-Muslim religions. So these missionaries were allowed to move about the country and uh, because they were registered as foreign citizens, they had unique political permission and could avoid a lot of the hardship that a lot of their uh, Ottoman citizen neighbors could not. Um, in particular, I want to point out here, Johannes Lepsius, 
Uh, he is a Protestant German missionary. Um, he served primarily uh, in the region of Hakare, which is in the southeastern part of what is today Turkey, near the border with Iran. Um, and uh, we're going to see some of his testimony primarily when it comes to the Seyfal, or the Assyrian genocide. Now, we should also talk about the tenuous relationship between the Russians and the um, Armenians. Um, the Dashnaks and the Hunchaks, of course, as I said, had their primary funding from Russia originally, but in 1903, um, the Russian Empire um, decided that the Armenian church being non-Orthodox, right? Um, the Armenian church is outside of Eastern Orthodoxy. It's what's called Oriental Orthodox, um, which rejects the council of Chalcedon. Um, so the Russian uh, government actually um, expropriated all Armenian church property and tried to force Armenian Christians to convert to Orthodox Christianity. That expropriation included um, Echmiazdin, uh, sorry, Echmiazdin, which you can see up there. Echmiazdin is the um, Armenian, um, the Armenian, uh, the Armenian, what is it called? The Armenian Holy See. It's the center of all of the Armenian um, church. And accordingly, um, this was seen by the Dashnaks and the Hunchaks as an attack on Armenian national identity um, through an attack on Armenian religious identity. Um, Golitsyn, who was the governor at the time, had a strong anti-Armenian bias um, and was also responsible for the destruction of a number of Armenian churches and uh, attacks on Armenian uh, citizens uh, within the Russian Empire. Now, the Russians at this time were also trying to figure out how would be the best way for them to expand their influence beyond um, where they controlled in the Ottoman Empire into the areas around Lake Vaughan. And you can see Lake Vaughan in the map. It's that lake just below the number 1915. Um, and of course, the natural uh, group to turn to would be the Kurds. And while Sheikh Ubaid al Mehri um, was dead by this point, he died in 1883. Um, there were a number of Kurdish leaders that the Russians directly financed as well. So in this way, they were sort of betting on both horses, right? If the Armenians would uh, would have success somehow uh, with, the Hush, uh, with the Hunchaks and the Dashnaks, uh, creating an independent or autonomous Armenian polity in the eastern part of the Ottoman Empire, they would be aligned with the Russians. And if the Kurds won, they would be aligned with the Russians. Now, of course, what we saw with Golitsyn and to the degree that they supported the Kurds, um, the Armenian expropriations were undone in 1905, and there was some repair of, of relations between uh, the Dashnaks and Hunchaks and the Russians, but it's important to remember um, that those relations were not perfect, and they had an, while it looked from the Ottoman perspective that there was a Russian conspiracy, from the Armenian perspective, it was much less clear that the Russians were doing anything to help them. And to the extent the Russians were helping them, the Dashnaks and the Hunchaks only got legitimacy as a result of the Hamidian massacres. So the Armenians led by um, Christopher Mikhailian, right? He was uh, one of the founders of the Dashnaks, um, moved to assassinate Abdul Hamid II in 1905. And this is called the Yildiz assassination attempt. Um, you can see that's the Yildiz Hamidia Mosque where um, Abdul Hamid was that day. Um, Christopher Mikhailian actually didn't uh, commit the assassination. He was killed about a year before while he was trying to figure out how the bomb would work. Um, the bomb explode, exploded in his face, so that did it. Um, but the Dashnaks followed him and uh, hewed to his plan. That bomb did kill 20 people, maimed another 56. Abdul Hamid himself, though, was generally uninjured um, because he had spent a longer time talking with the Sheikh al Islam or the head of uh, or the leader of Islam. Uh, it's a political position in the Ottoman Empire um, for about 20 minutes longer than he had intended and therefore was late to being where the bomb would explode and uh, would have otherwise killed him. 
Um, there's a question. Um, did the Armenians have any economic power that everybody was trying to confiscate? What kind of classes were mostly attacked? That's really a great question. So if we're talking about the Amira class that lives in Constantinople, those Armenians are incredibly wealthy, disproportionately so. You have a number of families like the Balyan family, which is known for construction. Uh, you have the Didian family, which is known uh, for weapons production, ironically, uh, and uh, chemical production. Um, so you have these very wealthy uh, families that are disproportionately wealthy. And in fact, if you look at the number of businesses that existed in the Ottoman Empire, Armenians are disproportionately represented uh, and Turks are disproportionately underrepresented. Um, in fact, the minorities, Jews, Greeks, um, yeah, Jew, Jews, Greeks, and Armenians, not Assyrians, because there aren't that many Assyrians in Constantinople, um, those, the Jews, Greeks, and, and Armenians that are in Constantinople are relatively wealthy. But when we're talking about the attacks in the East, right, we're talking about things like the Sassoon resistance, uh, we're talking about the area around Lake Vaughan, these Armenians are generally farmers and are not wealthy. Neither are the Kurds who are, who are attacking them. They're not wealthy either. Um, neither are the Hamidia Alalata, the Hamidia regulars. They're not wealthy either. Um, this, uh, to the extent that there is a class struggle, um, it's almost that the poor Armenians are being targeted in lieu of targeting the rich Armenians that the poor in the East, the poor Muslims in the East can't touch because there's just too much distance. So the Dashnaks um, wanted to find any way to remove Abdul Hamid from power because of the Hamidian massacres and because of his refusal um, to follow through on the obligations of the Treaty of Berlin, specifically Article 61, that would require changes within the Ottoman Empire, reforms in the Ottoman Empire to prevent uh, further Armenian uh, problems. And so the Dashnaks uh, joined up with the Young Turks. And the Young Turks, as I pointed out earlier, were a, a confederation of a number of different groups. There was, of course, the main group, which was the Committee of Union and Progress, led by Enver Ismail Bey. You can see him in the lower left-hand side, and we're going to see a lot of him. Um, the CUP um, was primarily a unionist party in orientation. And while it's not exactly the same as unionism in the British context, I feel like that picture is illustrative. The unionists, their primary view was maintaining the integrity of the lands of the Ottoman Empire. So anything that could be seen to break it up um, was something that they would oppose. Now, there were other uh, parts of the Young Turk uh, Confederation, such as the liberals, uh, led by Prince al -Hattin. Um And the liberals wanted to create a, a modern capitalist state and were more interested in the promotion of Ottomanism, the idea that all citizens of the Ottoman Empire should be equal um, and less concerned with territorial integrity. But the Liberal Party, the CUP, and the Dashnaks came together to overthrow uh, Abdul Hamid II and put him into retirement. Now, this coup d'etat uh, coup d'etat effectively worked because the CUP had maintained relations with the Ottoman Third Army. Now, the Ottoman Third Army was able to mobilize throughout the European part of the Ottoman Empire and directly attack um, Haide Bey, who was the leader of the Ottoman First Army, forcing him to accept the government. The uh, Shamsi Pasha, who you can see there, who was leader of the Second Army, refused to go along with the revolt, revolt and so he was assassinated. And when the Third Army arrived in Constantinople, uh, Abdul Hamid II gave up power um, and resigned in favor of his, uh, in favor of um, Murad, sorry, Mehmed V, who became a, a nominal emperor of the Ottoman Empire. Abdul Hamid II was really the last emperor of the, uh, sorry, the last sultan of the Ottoman Empire to wield autocratic power. Despite the promises of equality under the law, very quickly the 
CUP began to mobilize and um, because of elections, they were able to get majorities, sorry, they were able to um, get significant percentages uh, to align with them. And they were beginning to uh, foment their ideology. Now their ideology would be expanded and this was a gradual development from 1908 to 1913. Um, but the ideology of these young Turks was in the idea of Turanism or Pan-Turkism. Those two terms mean the same thing. And Turanism is the idea that there is a specific Turkish race and that this Turkish race is superior to all other races. It is a form of ethnic supremacism. Um, and it composes all of the different Turkish nations um, that exist, right? And so you can see that Turanist map that includes all of the territory in which Turks live, in which Turkmen's live, in which Azerbaijanis live, Uzbeks, uh, Turkmen's, um, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, um, and including the Turkic people uh, of uh, what is now Siberia um, in, uh, in creating this concept of uh, a great Turkish nation that has a, a strong degree of prestige. You can also see um, the quote, this is a quote from Atatürk that's very famous, Nemutlu Türküm Diyene, um, uh, and the translation is usually, how happy is he to, who says he is a Turk? Um, or how happy is he who is a Turk? Um, meaning that the Turkish identity has so much history, so much uh, culture and society behind it, that there's nothing for a Turk to do but be happy and rejoice in his identity as part of this pan-Turkic world. Now, to be fair, um, Kemal Atatürk was probably not as strongly pan-Turkic as some of uh, some of the other CUP members and some of the other members of his administration when that will come to power. But um, in many ways, he is seen as the standard bearer for this ideology in terms of his political success after World War I. Now, part of the racial superiority was evidenced by what was called the sun language theory, which was a theory that was promoted that held that the Turkish language was the origination language of all languages on earth. And that every other people is actually truly a Turkish person who has been corrupted um, and has been um, told their false languages, uh, taught their false languages, bastardized forms of Turkish in order to disassociate from that Turkish identity. And so you can see, uh, this, is a, this is one of the books of some language theory, some language theory began in this period and was fully developed in the 1930s. Um, there's a question about uh, whether there is uh, something that uh, came earlier. Um, I don't know if Putin's pan-Slavic views or his his, Rus his Russian views um, are inspired by this. I um, He certainly doesn't believe that Russian is the antecedent of all languages in the world, but he does believe that Russian is the antecedent of all the Slavic languages, which of course linguistically is false. Um, we have Old Church Slavonic, which definitely preceded the existence of Russian. So um, this language theory really was something that uh, developed as a result of Turks trying to justify the concept of racial superiority. Now there's a question here of, um, was there any, was there really any racial superiority in these views? Was it more of a survival mechanism? Um, I, don't, I don't really believe that to be the case. There are lots of ways to survive without um, creating an ethnic nationalism that excludes other populations. Um, and to the extent that this move was a move to Turkify the empire. Um, it was held that the Ottoman Empire would only survive as a confederation if it were a Turkish state. And that's the only way that the union could hold together is under a Turkish view, right? And this rejects the entire concept of Ottomanism, that all the subjects of the Ottoman Empire can be proud of a unified Ottoman state. And we can see this attempt to Turkify, not just against the Christian populations, but against Muslim populations as well. If you look at the Arab world, um, starting in 1910, we uh, starting in 1909, 1910, we start to have the forcible teaching of Arabs in Turkish. Um, and 
the argument towards Arabs that they are in fact Turks. You can see this is actually a Rushdie school, this uh, meaning that it was built by the Turks for middle school or middle school age people. Um, it was built in uh, the 1910s. This is actually a picture from 1925. And the Rushdie school actually still, this school actually still survives. It's been renamed, um, but it still survives in Jordan today. One of the other uh, one of the other major uh, developments um, is the systematization of non-Turkish languages being excluded from uh, the situation. You can see this is a multilingual sign from 1900 uh, in Constantinople. Signs like this were taken down and only Turkish language was allowed to be displayed on official memorandum. Uh, within ethnic neighborhoods, signs were allowed in local languages, but as a general matter, uh, any official process had to be done in Turkish, um, and um, this disempowered many of the minorities since their command of Turkish was very weak, especially out in the further provinces. Um, there's a question here, did modern Turkey under Ataturk went after any territory? Um, Yes, Ataturk actually uh, waged war against numerous different powers um, during the Turkish War of Independence. And that was in fact the point of it. Um, during the war, he actually invaded what is today Armenia as well. Um, so that's territory within the Russian Empire that the Ottoman Empire had not controlled uh, prior to World War I. So, and we'll talk about this during the peace on Ataturk in, and the Turkish War of Independence in two weeks, and the Caucasian Wars in three weeks, where we'll cover some of those, um, we'll, we're, we will cover some of those wars. Now, of course, after 1923, Ataturk made peace with all the nations that he had fought with. But that's not to say that he didn't invade other countries. He absolutely did. All right. Now, starting in 1909, we begin to have the armament of Christians. Um, the Ottoman army uh, starts conscripting Christians, believing that they need more bodies. Um, effectively, the losses in the Balkans are getting to the point where uh, Muslim soldiers alone would be insufficient uh, to control the territory and be able to secure um, the, uh, the integrity of the empire. And as unionists, the CUP wants to mobilize. So, we start having the drafting of Christians. At the same time, we have Armenian preachers who are noticing that Christians are allowed to buy weapons. It's for the first time, civilian Armenians can actually purchase guns for their own protection and for their involvement in the military. And so a number of Armenian preachers argue that Armenians should undertake the right to self-defense and acquire guns for themselves, which of course uh, puts many of their Muslim neighbors in a state of worry because of the possibility of revanchism, um, especially as a result of the Hamidian massacres of 1894 to 1896. And of course, the Armenian uh, preachers, in this case, these are fanatics as well. And they argue that perhaps revenge should be taken. Uh, perhaps it's worth making the, the Turks suffer after what they put the Armenians through. And so you begin to see increased agitation between the civilian Armenian communities and the civilian Turkish communities. Compounding this in the Turkish education system that both Abdul Hamid II and the Young Turks following him uh, set up, um, we have those schools teaching um, about the atrocities committed by Christians against Muslims. Um, we have numerous missionaries who report that in the schools there were large paintings of uh, Greek soldiers committing atrocities. In fact, this is one uh, such uh, picture. Uh, those, those are Greek soldiers in the Balkan, Balkan Wars, which took place in 1912. Um, so this was obviously done after that. But those Greek soldiers are attacking civilian Muslims um, and uh, forcing them to flee. Absolutely something that happened during the Balkan Wars. But the way that this would be taught is in much the same way that we see, for example, propagandized attacks against Americans in North Korea, right? You have these large paintings of Americans as monsters, and you have similar things going on in the Armenian schools, sorry, in the, in the schools in Turkey. 
So now, in 1909, there was a counter-revolution against the uh, young Turk administration led by uh, a number of religious leaders um, like uh, Derbish Vahdeti, um, as well as um, Hassan Fehmi Bey, uh, who was less religious, but more um, sort of like Joel Austin kind of religion. Um, not very, uh, not very uh, liturgically oriented, but very identity oriented. And he was the founder of the newspaper Serbesti. Um, the two of them worked together um, to put Abdul Hamid II back into power. Um, and eventually the young Turks were able to consolidate in what was called the Harakat Urdusu. Urdusu. Um, and on the 24th of April, uh, they uh, invaded Constantinople and redeposed Abdul Hamid II, uh, preventing him from ever taking power ever again. Now, What's important about this counter-revolution is that it led to the Adana massacre of 1909. So while uh, Abdul Hamid came into power, um, many of the Muslims saw it as a green light to attack the armed Armenians uh, in their area. And you can see sort of uh, a, a picture of that massacre as illustrated by the French uh, magazine, Le Petit Journal. Um, and the Armenian community of Adana um, was attacked at a number of different points. Um, it's believed that 20,000 uh, Armenians were killed in this massacre. Abdul Hamid, of course, who was in power during the time the massacre occurred, both denied that it occurred and argued that it had been a Turkish reaction to Armenian provocation, which is part and parcel of Turkish denialist claims now, both that it didn't happen and if it did happen, it was because Armenians did something. So you can already see the beginning of that sort of denialist um, development, even as early as 1909. Regardless, this massacre that clearly didn't happen resulted in so many orphans because of the people who had been killed that three orphanages were, be were built in Adana uh, and run by a number of missionaries. Um, you can see this is the Adana Darul Eitam, which is one of those three uh, orphanages. Uh, for the Armenians uh, as a result of this uh, war, uh, sorry, as a result of this massacre. You can also see um, the difference between Christian and Muslim quarters in Adana that are only a few hundred meters apart from each other, the Christian quarter on the left and the Muslim quarter on the right. Following uh, this, when the young Turks were able to take power again in the counter-revolution, they actually punished a number of Muslim perpetrators, along with several Armenians that they, uh, that they accused of being perpetrators as well. And the international community saw that response by the young Turks as taking ownership um, of the difficulties of the situation and actually afforded them uh, less and actually decreased their oversight um, because they felt that the young Turks were operating appropriately. Now, the Balkan League and we discussed this um, in episode 41, um, had designs on the Ottoman Empire in terms of conquering Ottoman territories. And accordingly, um, they facilitated a number of secret agreements in order to maintain those alliances and take Ottoman territory for their own. And that resulted in the first Balkan War of 1912 to 1913, which from the Ottoman perspective, was a horrible, horrible loss. And you can see the Bulgarian forces uh, marshalling at Thrace. You can tell uh, here from the Balkan League that they had agreed with the Serbians that that would be their direct thrust. Um, and so you can see that playing out right here. The Bulgarian forces were incredibly destructive uh, to the Ottoman line, warning key battles at uh, Kirkilisa. And, um, and other uh, locations within Eastern Thrace. Within the Bulgarian forces were a number of Armenian contingents. Um, they, were, they were a small part of the Bulgarian force overall, less than 10%, but they would be commanded by two very famous Armenian commanders, uh, Andrei Nikozanyan and uh, Grigory Nizhde. And Ozanyan and Nizhde um, would eventually play a huge role in the Caucasian Wars. We'll talk about that in three weeks. Um, 
the Ottomans uh, signed uh, an armistice at Chitalja um, in 1913, in, uh, which gave the Bulgarians most of the European part of Turkey. But of course, the fact that Armenians had engaged the Ottoman Turks at, with the Bulgarians now um, increased the fear in Turkey that Armenians were going to be an oppositional force within the empire. They were already allying with uh, the historic enemies of the Ottoman Empire, the Russians and the Bulgarians. Now, there was a coup d'etat in 1913, just following uh, the armistice, and that resulted in Enver uh, Pasha, Enver Ismail, you can see him there in the middle of the picture, um, leading uh, the removal of the government that was oper in operation in 1912. The, uh, the, uh, as we discussed in episode 41, there was a counter coup in 1912, that put a different group of officers in power and this coup removed that coup. So you can see that the Ottoman Empire is an incredibly stable place with lots of liberal democracy and voting. Um, as a result of this voting, uh, we have Enver Ismail forcing uh, the resignation of the Grand Vizier, Mehmed Kamil Pasha. And this leads to the creation of the CUP triumvirate. Um, these are individuals from the Committee of Union and Progress um, that would lead the Ottoman Empire. Now, one of the things that we sort of skipped over a little bit when we talked about the Balkan Wars, because I covered it more in depth in episode 41, was that Turks were expelled during these Balkan Wars. There were numerous massacres against, uh, against Turks um, throughout the territory. And these were committed not just by Bulgarians, but by Greeks and Serbians as well uh, in the various regions that each of them was invading. The, um, additionally, because the Greeks were maintaining a naval position, they were preventing the arrival of food, starving out many of the Turkish villages um, throughout uh, Europe. And so what ends up happening is that we have a large number of emigrants coming from the Balkans as a result of these persecutions. It's estimated that 200,000 um, Muslims in the Balkans were killed during the Balkan Wars, and 1.5 million immigrated to the Ottoman Empire. So um, if you actually look at the population of Turkey today, um, roughly one-fifth of all Turks um, are descended from the Muhajir, or these emigrants, um, who came to Istanbul uh, fleeing their homeland. You can see um, in the lower left-hand side, those are Palmaks um, who, uh, who were forced to flee Bulgaria during the Balkan Wars. And you can see this is a picture of the port in Istanbul uh, being crowded by the trains of emigrants in the city. As is expected, um, the emigrants were not uh, warmly received in Turkey by the local population, but they were warmly received by the government, which saw fit to settle them in the territory. Now, there's a question about whether or not what happened to the Turks um, in uh, the Balkan region in, during the Balkan Wars is a genocide. And I would say in certain cases, yes, and in other cases, no. Um, in the Bulgarian case, it certainly is um, because you have top-down orders uh, to remove Muslim townships. Um, significant parts of the Southern part of what is now Bulgaria um, had Muslim majorities. And in order for those areas to be Bulgarified, the Muslims had to be removed. You then have situations with uh, the Greeks where you have starvations. Um, those starvations might not be necessarily a genocide, but there are towns that the Greeks directly targeted during the war, and those would be a genocide. From the Serbian side, the Serbians moved against the region of Sanjak, um, which is today in the Republic of Serbia. Um, and part of it is in the Republic of Montenegro. The Muslims of Sanjak were directly targeted and exterminated. Um, in fact, there are areas um, in Bosnia and in Serbia, um, the ones in Serbia have been renamed, but the areas in Bosnia have not, called uh, Mahale Muhajira, uh, 
meaning uh, Muhajir centers, because of how many Muhajir passed through those towns fleeing the persecution of the Serbians. So absolutely, we have a number of genocides and targeted massacres that occur uh, against the Turks in this period. Now, There's a question of, could the expelling of Turks from the Balkans be called an ethnic cleansing? And is there a legal definition of ethnic cleansing? Um, there is probably a, a legal definition of ethnic cleansing. I don't know it off the top of my head. The functional uh, difference between ethnic cleansing and genocide is that ethnic cleansing doesn't necessarily try um, as, a, as a primary measure to exterminate the population, um, but it's a very fuzzy boundary. And in a lot of cases, uh, what is one person's ethnic cleansing is another person's genocide. Um, I would just, uh, and I think the other thing is that if there's no intent to destroy them, only to remove them. So it's a fuzzy boundary. But in the case of a lot of what happened in the Balkan Wars, there was an intent to exterminate um, by the leadership. It wasn't, it wasn't simply that they should be pushed into Turkey. It was that they didn't belong in the Balkans. Um, and so any way to get rid of them would be, uh, would be acceptable. Um, so and there's a question. So the remnants of what you've just described are, are still there to be exploited 78 to 80 years later? Absolutely. Um, in Turkey today, um, a lot of the most reactionary views, especially as concerns the Armenian genocide uh, and other CUP genocides come from the Muhajir community within Turkey. Because many Muhajir still know uh, that they are descendants of Muhajir, even though they fully identify as Turks. And today they are fully considered part of the Turkish society. They're not considered somehow different in the same way that, for example, white Catholics and white Protestants um, they recognize each other as being different, but still equally accepted by society. Um, those uh, Muhajirs are among the most reactionary views because they still believe that the Balkan countries have not properly apologized for the genocides and massacres that were perpetrated against them uh, and their ancestors in the Balkans, uh, which is entirely correct. Um, it doesn't justify their view on the CUP genocides, but it justifies their anger towards those Christian majority states. Um, in terms of who's interested in exploiting them, um, they don't vote as a bloc um, because the Turkish position on the Armenian genocide is pretty unanimous across the political spectrum. So um, they voted for all different political parties. Uh, it just happens that they tend, to, if they are elected, they tend to be more vociferously opposed to that than other, um, let's say, Anatolian ethnic Turks. Now, because of this large migration of Muhajir into the Ottoman Empire, as I said, 1.5 million of them come in, um, we have the uh, we have the desire by the CUP to reorganize the Ottoman Empire in a way that is more conducive to holding these Muhajir. And so they, uh, they expedite procedures to get Christians out of Constantinople and other desirable cities. And in some cases, they use violence to coerce uh, Christians to leave and to go towards countries in Europe. Once those houses are vacated, either by the by the administrative reforms or from uh, low scale violence muhajirs are settled into those houses and there's this project effectively of making constantinople more and more it was already a muslim majority city certainly but a city that was more overwhelmingly muslim than it had been before and weeding out the historic christian communities of kumkapa for the armenians um, and fanar for the greeks Um, there's a question of uh, all victims want equal sympathy? Absolutely. Um, and I think that all groups who, to the extent that they were persecuted, deserve sympathy and recognition for the crimes that they suffered. The fact that Russia doesn't recognize the Circassian genocide is just as much of an, of an indignity as the fact that Turkey doesn't recognize the Armenian genocide. Um, 
then we should recognize the pain that everybody went through. Um, there's another question. I never heard of all these groups of people. Uh, were they tribes? Do they still exist? Palmacs still exist. Um, there are some Palmacs in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is still 14% Muslim, though I don't know the extent to which those 14% are Turks um, or Palmacs. Palmacs are Bulgarian Slavic Muslims. Um, their uh, muhajir is not an ethnic term. It is a collect is, is a catch-all term. It just means emigrant, and it refers to those populations that came into the Ottoman Empire from about 1867, right, with the Circassian genocide, all the way until um, 1923 with the um, Greco-Turkish population exchange. Um, there's a question: To what extent was Balkan anger at Turkish rule justified? Um, yeah, it was, I think it was certainly justified. Like the, I think a lot of people confuse recognition that violence towards a civilian population is categorically unjustified with the power structures that were operating at the time were also unjust. And they represented in some way the views of the civilian population that was massacred. The Ottoman government in, um, in Europe in many ways was less um, repressive than the Kurds and Circassians were in the East. And there was a more unified uh, Ottoman government. That said, it was very difficult for testimony in courts to be equal. It was very difficult for um, for Greeks to get permits to move around the country. There's all kinds of different issues that the minority populations had. The only minority that didn't rise up against the Ottomans throughout this period were the Jews. And there's a pretty good reason for that, um, which is that the Jews were not concentrated in any one area. Um, to the extent that they were concentrated, we're talking about, in, for example, the Balat district in Constantinople, we're talking about maybe 3% of the city. Um, it's just, there's just not enough people on the ground, but also the Jews were heavily involved in politics in the Ottoman Empire at this time. There were Jews who were part of the CUP, uh, like Emmanuel Carrasso. Um, and one of the things that I talked about in, I believe it was episode 40, but it may have been episode 41, um, is that um, Theodor Herzl, as one of his angles in trying to convince the Ottoman Empire to create a Jewish state in Jerusalem um, was that he would convince Jewish writers to downplay the Armenian genocide um, as sort of an exchange of sorts. Um, Abdul Hamid II rejected this. Um, no, sorry. You know, sorry, this was during the Hamidian massacres, not the Armenian genocide. Um, uh, Abdul Hamid II refused this, but you can see to a certain extent that there was collusion. Now there were other Zionists not aligned with Herzl on this decision. Max Nordau was probably the most famous of those. All right. So now starting in the beginning of 1914, as, as I pointed out, you had all those muhedras coming in and you also had the beginnings of Greek deportations and Greek boycotts. There's a combination of reasons for these Greek boycotts. They started actually in 1909 when the Enosis or union between, Cyprus, between Crete and Greece was proclaimed and Crete became part of, the, of, of Greece. Um, and so there was a lot of, there were a number of Muhajir who fled Crete uh, to the Ottoman Empire and they brought their neg anti-Greek negativity with them, well-deserved in this case. Um, but the way that this manifested here is that we began to have a massacres and forced uh, uh, deportations of Greeks on the Mediterranean coast of Turkey, very close to the city of Smyrna, modern Izmir, um, is the city of Fokaya. Uh, today, it's the Turkish city of Focha. And you had Chetes, which were modeled in Turkey after the, after the Serbian Chetas, uh, a paramilitary group. And these Chetes um, attacked Greek houses, plundered them. And you can see, this is a picture of Turkish Chetes uh, showing uh, their loot uh, after uh, the massacre in Fokaya. We also have uh, Greeks being forced onto boats um, 
this is a picture um, near the between Fokaya and Ivalik. And in Ivalik, the Kaimakam of Ivalik um, used the threat of violence um, to remove Greeks, even uh, saying, today you can live peaceably, tomorrow there will be violence. So we have this sort of um, expulsion of Greeks and the anti-Greek boycott, which had preceded them and was carried through these massacres was based on the fact that the Greeks were economically ascendant as well. As, as I pointed out, Armenians and Greeks and Jews were disproportionately overrepresented in terms of business and commerce. Throughout the Ottoman period, Greeks in particular had access to a number of um, Ottoman charters that would allow them to perform, um, expand business that Muslims often could not do, legally speaking, they could not do. And Greeks were all heavily involved, especially in shipping, um, which remains to this day. Greeks were also involved in banking. In fact, there are still Greek uh, banks in Egypt. Some of them, uh, most of them are now run by Egyptians, no longer by Greeks, because Greeks were expelled from Egypt uh, in the 1950s. But uh, this economic ascendance in the Ottoman Empire played very poorly when compared to the situation of those Muhajirs who had just been exiled from Crete and now saw the Greeks in the Ottoman Empire with more wealth than they had. Uh, there's a question of why were so many people obsessed with killing? All religions were against killing. Um, it's not about the religions per se, right? Um, as I pointed out, there are fanatical preachers who on both Christian and Muslim sides who are encouraging killing. But by and large, the killing is not motivated by an exhortation to scripture. The killing is primarily motivated through the political lens of these religions being ethnic identifiers. In It's much the same way that, for example, in the post-Reconstruction South, in the Jim Crow South of the United States, there were fights between whites and blacks. Um, of course, they were dominated by one side, but let's let's ignore that for the moment. The white and black are ethnic identifiers, and we sort of see that very clearly because it's something that's physical about the person. In the Ottoman Empire, these religious groups are functioning as ethnic identifiers, and so those massacres are being brought about because of the ethnic conflict that's manifesting with religious terminology, but it's not a religious conflict per se. Um, one of the points that's made here, and it's absolutely correct, is that the Greeks were able to have those uh, special uh, business protections because of the capitulations. Um, and uh, those capitulations were uh, treaties that the Ottoman Empire had signed with the Western powers, primarily France and Britain, uh, in order to guarantee um, good relations with those countries. There's a question of why were the Greeks kicked out of Egypt? Um, this was during the reign of Gamal of the Nasser, and Nasser's perspective was that Egypt should be an Arab country, and so the minorities of Egypt, the Turks, um, the Greeks, the Jews, um, I'm trying to think, there are uh, the, uh, the Libyans to a certain extent, although it's sort of harder to delimit, to delimit what a Libyan is, um, all these populations had to be removed from Egypt in order for Egypt to be a country for Egyptians. Um, there's a question of, were there any acts of kindness? I see only hatred. Um, absolutely, there were certainly acts of kindness. Uh, one of the things, and I'll get to it when I talk about the Shkilete Masosa, uh, or the special organization, um, is that a law was passed in Eastern Anatolia that made it illegal for Muslims, Kurds, Turks, uh, and Circassians, to, and Arabs, uh, to protect Armenians uh, from the attacks of the Tashkilate Masosa, and the only reason you need to pass a law like that is because people are protecting the innocent. And we have numerous cases during the genocide of people protecting the innocent. Um, Muslims acting in good faith towards their Christian neighbors. And we have uh, situations in the Balkans also of Greeks or Serbians protecting Muslims who came under their territory. We have fewer of those than we do of the Turkish cases but there's many more deaths in the Turkish cases. So that's, that's the comparison. Um, and of course you have 
families that are split apart by this. There are families where one spouse is Muslim and one spouse is Christian. So you do have that world, but as we're moving closer and closer to World War One, we're seeing increased, increased um, in hospital, uh, uh, sorry, uh, negativity between these communities. There's a comment of, if I remember correctly, killing each other along with most other human foibles shows up early in the Pentateuch. Um, there is, a, I don't know how much into religion we actually want to go here. Um, the commandment in the Bible is don't murder. Um, that's the sixth commandment uh, under the Jewish count. I don't know what the number is under the Christian counts because Christians count the commandments differently, but the commandment is don't murder, not, not do not kill. Um, so, cause there are many exhortations throughout the Pentateuch, um, to kill, uh, certain populations, especially the Canaanite populations. So, um, and you, so there is religious legitimacy towards the violence that said, that's not the argument that most religious leaders are making. Um, So now that's not to say that there wasn't religious endorsement of the of, of violence. So when World War I started and Turkey was brought on the side of the central powers, uh, Sheikh al Islam Mustafa Hayri Effendi um, declared jihad or Islamic holy war um, against uh, the allies, especially because Greece and Serbia were out, uh, Greece, Serbia, and Russia also were allies. Um, and the idea was hopefully to motivate more Muslims to fight against the allied cause. He also pointed out that the jihad extended to any uh, insubordinate uh, groups within the Ottoman Empire who would be opposing the Muslims. And in this way, it worked to inflame the tensions that were already existing uh, between the Muslims and the Christians of the empire. So while I'm gonna talk about the actual war, it seems like considering how we haven't even gotten to the genocide yet uh, and we're nearly, nearing the witching hour, it seems like we're probably gonna be talking about the genocide next week as well and pushing everything else back. But um, when I get to talking about the war, I'm going to talk about a lot more of the battles and the fronts and other things like that. But in order to understand the Armenian genocide, we have to understand the Battle of Sarakamish. This is the only battle in the war that's really uh, important uh, to understand uh, for this. Okay, there's a question actually, what was the relationship between Turkey and other Muslim countries? That's actually a really great question. Um, most Muslim countries were under colonial authority of some kind at this time, be it the British in India, um, be it, uh, the Russians in Persia, right? We talked about that in episode 42. Uh, under the uh, British or French in the, in the, uh, in, sorry, in North Africa or Italians in the case of Libya. There were Muslims in China that were under the Qing dynasty, um, which was controlled by spheres of influence by the imperialists in China. But that doesn't mean that the influence of the Sultan Caliph, uh, sorry, that the that the Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire and um, and the prestige of the Sultan Caliph um, didn't command respect throughout the world. Um, one of the things that I talked about when it came to the German Ottoman alliance in the late 1800s is that when the Germans were fighting against the Boxer Rebellion, um, they were one of the contingents of the Boxer Rebellion were the what were called the Gansu Braves because they came from the region of Gansu in Western China and these Gansu braves were Muslim. So the Germans actually asked uh, for the Ottomans to issue a fatwa uh, for the Gansu braves to stand down. And the Ottomans actually did it. Um, the fatwa came too late for it to actually have a military effect, but the Gansu braves would have gone through with it um, had, they, um, had they received the fatwa. So um, 
the Ottoman Empire commanded an incredible amount of respect uh, in the Muslim world. That said, politically speaking, a lot of the Arabs who would have been incentivized to fight by this jihad um, were much more angry with the way that they had been abused um, by, the, uh, by the CUP, by the forced Turkification that had occurred during the 1910s. And therefore, they ended up siding with the British, right? That's the whole T.E. Lawrence, Sharif of Mecca, all that. So now for the Battle of Sadakamish, Enver Pasha, Enver Ismail, you can see him in the picture of the CUP. Um, he's second from the left in the back row. Um, you can always recognize him by that mustache. Um, so Enver Ismail Pasha um, was a guy who fancied himself a military expert. And in fact, he had been involved in the Balkan Wars, um, commanding the retaking of Edirne. Um, which gained him a lot of acclaim. And he was involved, though, didn't really do much um, in the Ottoman, uh, uh, sorry, the Italo-Turkish War, which saw Libya con come under uh, Italian occupation. And he figured that he was going to fight a war against Russia that would be an easy victory. Um, think sort of like Schlieffen plan kind of thought process of there's going to be one quick battle and this will destroy the Russian flank, and then he can reallocate the Ottoman third and fourth armies onto the Western side and deal with, with the Greeks and the Serbians. Now, the process, the strategy that he decided to use um, was in conjunction with German military advisors. You can see Otto von Feldmann um, from the German military who is with him uh, in the Eastern part of Turkey. And this uh, would require um, the strategy that was employed in the Battle of Tannenberg, um, which was an incredibly uh, complex strategy and would require covering ground incredibly quickly. In order to cover that ground quickly, in order to cover that ground quickly, um, what the Ottomans did is that they dropped off all unnecessary supplies or supposedly unnecessary supplies. This included food, winter coats. Remember, this is December. Food, winter coats. Um, extra ordnance, all these kinds of things so that they, that they can move more quickly throughout the mountains and go through the pass of Sadakamish. The, the Russians, by contrast, were set up in a way where they could effectively defend uh, the territory. They had much thicker jackets, they had more ammunition, and they actually had a superior force numerically. As one can imagine, when a force that's dying of frostbite and starvation comes against a force that is well-armed, entrenched, and in control of the territory, the Russians did quite well in the Battle of Sarakamish. And Enver Ismail Pasha never commanded uh, any more military uh, endeavors uh, in World War I after this. Now, accounts differ as to whether this was the case, but, um, we know for certain that there were Armenian conscripts who were fighting in the Battle of Sadakamish. Um, those conscripts were organized under the draft laws starting in 1909, right? We talked about the Christians being involved in the military. So there were Armenian conscripts here. And those Armenian conscripts um, were reported. Again, the, there are questions about the accuracy of the report. There's um, that the Armenians actually were the ones who protected uh, Enver Pasha and helped him get out of the field because he was in a very precarious position. That said, at a postmortem with the other leaders of the CUP, um, Enver Ismail Pasha was unable to take responsibility for commanding such a foolhardy attempt and instead blamed the Armenians for the resulting loss. Um, the this is in many cases the beginning of the intent forming to exterminate the Armenians. Um, Enver Pasha arguing that the conscript Armenians um, had betrayed them to the Russians, that there had been secret uh, a secret allegiance between the Armenian Ottoman Armenians and the Russians uh, in order to weaken the Ottoman Empire and allow the Russians to achieve victory at Sadakamish. All right.
since we're past uh, we're past the magical uh, wishing hour, I'm going to skip to questions, comments, and concerns, and we'll continue with the Armenian genocide next week. Um, there's a question of, I can't understand all these wars except for some, uh, for some to protect themselves or sick egos of the rulers. World War I is pretty much that. Um, there's no real justification for World War I in the European context. In the Ottoman context, it allowed them to get retribution on the Russians, or at least that's what they thought it would do. Um, and to be fair, the Ottoman Empire survived longer than the Russians did. So, um, and they, and after Ataturk won the Turkish War of Independence, he recovered territories taken in 1878. But at, at face value, yeah, there's really no benefit um, to, to these wars, especially in terms of the humanitarian cost. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns about what we've been talking about so far? So, Rich, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Is that, tr is that true that when, uh, and again, I apologize if I'm inciting anything, I'm sorry, but uh, is it true when there was um, extermination of Armenians that um, the high net worth individuals, uh, Armenians that lived in Istanbul, that the one they exterminated, that Turkish government had requested AXA equitable to pay insure life insurance for those people that were exterminated? Or yes. this is just completely, that was no, true? No, no, this is, this is true. Um, there are, um, we also see insurance claims um, filed by Nazi Germany on behalf of Jews whose property was expropriated. So um, this, uh, it was, yeah. So Hitler actually took it right out of the Ottoman Turkish playbook. That, that absolutely did happen. Um, and we have records from American insurance companies denying um, coverage in some cases, giving coverage in other cases where they didn't quite understand the situation um, because a lot of the buildings were insured in, in the United States because there was a much better insurance industry in the US than there was in the Ottoman Empire. And in contrast to the European countries, the Americans had never had imperial designs on the Ottoman Empire. And therefore there were much better commercial relations between the Americans and the Ottomans, at least prior to um, the US's entry into World War I in 1916. Um, and uh, thank you for all the, all the kind words. Um, yeah. Thank you, Richard. This was really incredible. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, Aaron, I wanted to ask if you wanted to comment a little bit on those sources that you were um, putting in the chat. <clears throat> sure. Um, so uh, I, I think you could see, well, I think the first one I put in there was um, it's um, a university of uh, Germany, Munch, well, we would say Munster, but uh, Munster, like that's yeah, uh, you know, like like Munster cheese is actually like <laughs> you know the Adams family, uh, but uh, um, and so that's a pretty um, uh, uh, you know a, a top researcher in, in the world on uh, on on studying the um, chronology and background of the of the Ten Commandments and across. Uh, five, 600 years of, of, of its development from the more modern, not modern by today's standard, but, but modern as we were going into the development of the Roman Republic, the standards of the Hebrew Bible, all the way through the construction of, the, of all the variant Christian um, uh, you know, books that eventually constructed the, the uh, first compilation uh, Bibles. And uh, so that was that. That was that research. And then, if you look at the other uh, three pieces, the last one is uh, the University of Southern California. Um, given that there's a, a pretty obviously substantial um, Armenian population in Southern California, or in California for that matter, um, over the last roughly 50 years, um, you know the USC has uh, has a 
a genocide research center and obviously a, a big uh, a Jewish and, and, and also African uh, and, and, and other uh, populations uh, from, from, from parts of, uh, of the Indo-Pacific that have, that have uh, suffered from uh, genocides and, and uh, uh, mass killings. Uh, so they have a, uh, they have, to my knowledge, the first LLM that is in, in essence, um, uh, um, you know, basically genocide law, and uh, um, and and then they run um, programs on on developing judges and 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 uh, prosecutors and, and investigators, and so uh, they've had quite a bit of uh, oh, they have an enormous archive, obviously. So I, I put in some uh, some of that information for anyone that really wants to sort of drill down. And then, uh, then there's just two good sources on uh, on World War One. There's actually, you know, it's, it's the Encyclopedia, on 1914, 1918, um, which you know kind of breaks down World War One. It's kind of neat. It kind of like whichever side, wherever you come in from, it will have that uh, actor's chronology, and so you can kind of do these interesting little circles coming in from. Uh, whether it's Russian or British, American, uh, Ottoman, you know, you name it. And then uh, the last one is uh, um, kind of a surprising one, but in uh, New Zealand, um, because I guess sometimes when, uh, you know, obviously they participated in World War One, but, you know, they weren't obviously a major actor. Uh, because they were part of the British Empire. Uh, as, as uh, So they've developed this sort of uh, very, um, you know, a solid, World War One research uh, set of programs over the last uh, thirty odd years, uh, which is somewhat uh, uh, interesting. But I think because they don't have a lot of, uh, you know, they don't have a huge dog in the fight um, in terms of history. Um, you know, uh, whatever one's left for for World War One, I, I think they're a lot more dispassionate. So I, I put uh, really good stuff in there, which actually their stuff's phenomenal. Actually, um, so so that's kind of that uh, material. Hopefully, that helps people who. Um, you might want to go more. more deeper. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, there, there's a question that I think actually both of us uh, should answer a little bit. Um, what is was the basis for the long-term special relationship between Germany and Turkey in the second half of the 20th century? Um, most of that special relationship, and Aaron, uh, please correct me or add if uh, where I'm wrong here, um, was related to the German recovery after World War II. And so Germany needed a large scale migrant labor force yep. in order to rebuild the country. And so there was a, a massive migration of people from Turkey to Germany, which now that the descendants of that population number roughly 4 million people. Um, and that is a Turkish population that is now born and living in Germany. And because of that, they maintain that kind of relationship and connection. Yeah, and, and, and I would say there's a, a very, uh, and, and, and I know by maybe U.S. or um, Western European standards or, or norms, the, you know, let's say the evolution of modern Turkey and, and democratic norms of many Western states might uh, not be completely comfortable with having a, a, a very tight and and, and sort of um, deep set of relationships, but uh, with West Germany, and that's what we have to remember, it was West Germany. Uh, uh, they were, you know, in the in, in mid fifties, once uh, West Germany in 54 joined NATO, uh, you know, you wound up having, um, you know, a much deeper relationship because prior to that, for, you know, better part of, of uh, you know, 50 years, you already had existing military relationships. And so there was, a, uh, you know, they, they wound up sharing. And, and, and I think the thing that we don't maybe fully appreciate today because this is just a different world, but in terms of industrial development, raw materials, you know, the, the things that we might um, view that you need to extract out of different regions of the world today most of that would have been extracted out of, or, uh, you know, what we would call a, a sort of legacy or latent Ottoman empire. Um, and, you know, and, and so they had very strong trading relationships, um, you know, very strong, um, uh, in not quite industrial development, but let's say extractive, uh, industries, 
that you know we would call monopolies by by today's standards um, or state monopolies really. Um, so and and the thing to recognize about Turkey or, or German, um, well, there's 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 words in German that or phrases that that reference you know the multi generational um, Turks uh, or people with Turkish backgrounds that are that are German. I, I think the closest proximity for those of you that are um, in the U.S. that are that are here um, is really sort of the Mexican American um, development of in the from from the first half to the second half of the 20th century. And when, when you're looking at a population that now is, you know, five percent of Germany, um, you know, on its way basically, well, oh, it's actually yeah, it's over five percent now. It's on its way to to ten percent, and more importantly, it's moved into this sort of, uh, you know, mixed uh, culture and and mixed marriage. So there's a there's a version of um, the way we have Spanglish. They have their own sort of German Turkish. That's sort of a, you know, whatever they would call that. <laughs> I don't know how you would. You, Germany is not an easy language to sort of squish, uh, multi. So maybe uh, Turk you know, Turkmen or something like that. But uh, but but that's what you have. So it's a it's a it's a pretty um, you know, it's, it's a very large evolution there. And, and of course, this is from a country that obviously isn't next door, like France or Poland. Um, so it's, it's kind of wild when you think that the fact that there's more people with Turkish background in Germany than there are people with Polish backgrounds in Germany. And obviously there's, there's reasons for that, but, but we're looking at proximity. Um, I, I, I would also like to add one last thing, which is that there's a political relationship in that many of the dissident movements that were banned in Turkey throughout the 1930s, 40s, 50s, yep. 60s, 70s, 80s, all those years uh, were permitted in Germany. And so you have uh, this sort of feedback loop that's that now point. that some of those dis dissident movements are in power, that's the AKP, for example, yep. um, you have that connection as well. And in fact, there's a higher percentage of German Turks are AKP supporters than Turkish Turks are. Yep. Yeah, no, actually, it's it's a very fascinating dynamic because um, it it's 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 actually you know once again it it's sort of um, uh, you know fact following sort of fiction. So in a very similar way as uh, multi generational um, uh, people from you know across Latin America that are in the United States, you'll have an older generation that you could maybe consider to be a little more conservative. More, more religious oriented, et cetera. So, um, you know, th those populations in Germany will vote CDU and then the younger generations are, you know, social Democrat, Greens, et cetera, um, you know, and, and are much more, I mean, they're really, it's, it's, almost, it's, it's almost the same actually, the way that you would see a, a lot of, you know, uh, older versus younger uh, people from, from Latin America and the United States um, you know, just like you'd have older or versus younger people from, from, from Turkey that, that have migrated into Germany or that have grown up in, in Germany. And so, so you have these very interesting sort of divergence, uh, you know, politically and socially, um, you know, which really defines the fact that these are basically Turkish Germans is what it really boils down to. And, uh, or German Turks, you know, whatever, you know, how, however, someone sees that relationship, you know, just like someone might say Mexican American or American with Mexican scent, um, and 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 that is, I think, um, except for France, um, you, you don't really have a place in continental Europe at that scale. If we're talking, you know, five, ten million people um, in a, in, a, in in one of the countries that have a, a long history and that are basically being fully integrated. And I think that's the difference is that, you know, you look at regions at, at their version or their states and their city states. I mean, you have uh, Turkish Germans um, that are elected, uh, you know, uh, across city government and state government, et cetera. And, and in the uh, and in the Bundestag and so on. Um, and, and a big thing to recognize in Turkey, too, is that in a in, in a way that. Um, uh, 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 students are taught in schools, you know, their version of primary schools, high schools, you know, uh, universities, you know, German is a, is a substantial language that's, that's taught there. Um, and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I would say, I think at this point, English or what we call like sort of business English, technology English, that's 
at this point probably taught everywhere. Um, so that's that probably has some primacy. But in terms of fully learning a language, I would say, you know, uh, German and 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 probably Arabic or or, or no, on no, average. No, no. Ar- Ar- Arabic is not is not yeah. taught so much in Turkey. It's it's really seen as a backward language by most yeah. Anyway, yeah. So let's uh, it, it, seeing that there are no additional questions, I'll sort of walk sure. through um, the schedule. Uh, so we will finish the Armenian genocide next week. Following that, we will do World War One in two weeks um, from the Middle Eastern perspective. Um, and we're only going to cover World War One in the Middle East. Trust me, there's more than two hours <laughs> to cover in the Middle East. 200 we've, hours if you we, wanted to. We've got, we've got five different fronts. Um, then following that, we will do the Turkish War of Independence. And following that, we will do the Caucasian Wars. So that should get us through all of um, this cavalcade of disaster uh, between Thessaloniki and Yerevan um, uh, over the course of the next month. And then we'll finally be able to break into the 1920s um, with, uh, with more discussions about things like Sykes-Picot and the, cha- and the changes in the Arab Middle East. So that's sort of where we're going in terms of our long-term trajectory in the Middle Eastern series. Um, Aaron and I are going to do our European um, our European Union series. That's going to be on the twenty third of uh, of what month are we in now? July, uh, the twenty third of July. Um, as Zach mentioned at the top of the hour, um, the this weekend is going to be the uh, Roman soldier reenactment uh, done by Sergio, which is going to be fantastic. Um, he is. Uh, he's actually a military reenactor, so he'll have all the uniforms and uh, everything, so you can sort of see uh, what it was like as a Roman soldier. Um, is there anything I'm missing? All right. Um, with that, I'll let everybody go to sleep, uh, and we. I look forward to seeing you again. I hope that Uh, You enjoyed uh, tonight's presentation and next week it is. Yeah. Thank you. Great job, Richard. That was a great presentation. Thanks. All right. Bye.